so much. First, thanks to Brent and Nina for putting this together for me. I do so appreciate that. And to the museum for allowing us to house it here. I'm always surprised at how many people have interest in this. When I started, uh, when I started this, it was, as I told a few of you, it was almost a ghost. It was like a ghost environment. There was almost no information available. There were some books available, but this type of art form you have to see done, whether it's videos, but nothing, nothing beats seeing it done in person. And uh, I'm not here to do a demo tonight, actually, just to talk. What I, what I like to do is when I'm going around to different either dental meetings or science meetings, I will usually try and contact the calligraphy guild in the area and often give a talk. So, um, <clears throat> so tonight my talk is entitled uh, Ornamental Penmanship, Its History and Development. And uh, uh, this is a part of a script piece I did. It's just, we can go to the next slide. Let me tell you a little bit about my, my, my background. Thank you so much for my uh, trusty assistant back there flipping slides. Uh, I'm at, those of you who, how many people are aware of me from the internet, know about my presence on the internet? So you may be aware that I was you know, originally up in Milwaukee. I'm originally from Hoboken, New Jersey, Frank Sinatra's hometown. Uh, but I was up in Milwaukee at Marquette University School of Dentistry for about 12 years. And I moved to the Dental College of Georgia at Augusta University. And those of you who golf know that the Masters tournament is coming up in not too distant future. Uh, and Augusta becomes a very different town at that point, or so I'm told. Uh, this is a beautiful dental school. I came down here as September 1st as the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and Advanced Education. A long title, I'm still not quite sure what it means, but that's me. Uh, <laughs> next slide, please. So this is a very simplistic overview. And some of you have seen my talks, I have, have seen this before. It was adapted from the Parker Penn Company website. You know, calligraphy goes back a long ways. What we're interested in here, basically, comes into this area here, very brief period of time, okay? But keep in mind, when I talk about round hand, English round hand, there's influences from this from Italian hands, German hands, you know, and, and these were not, I'll talk about the instruments that we used to write this, but the goal for me tonight is not only give you an idea of how ornamental penmanship was developed in this country, but also to try and put some to lay to rest some of the name game that goes on. So many people are so confused by terminology. Copper plate, round hand, and rarer script, and grocery script. So I want to put that to rest uh, as much as I could. I don't know if you could ever completely put it to rest. Uh, can we get to the next slide, please? So, you know, Sir Ambrose Hill, a really big publication, a monumental publication, uh, identified a period from about 1570 to 1800 where you had the English writing masters, okay? And this is where they did round hand script. Now what some people don't understand about this is this was not done with a pointed pen feather quill. It was done with a narrow broad edge because Bickham himself, George Bickham, in one of his books actually describes how to cut the edge. And I'm not sure how this is produced. I've never tried to do it myself. I've written with quills but only doing text lettering. So this is what you would call round hand. Now whether you spell it Round hand is one word, round hand with a, with a, with a dash, or two words, uh, I don't really care. So uh, there are some, there are some, uh, it, because I've had some people who are so afraid to talk to me, and what about if I call it the wrong thing? He said, I don't get mad at that. That to me is, is was arguing about the wrong stuff. But there is, there are historical differences here. So if you were to compare it to my specimen, you notice that my specimens, you know, may be a little bit more defined with the shades, hairlines tend to be thinner, for those of us who are crazy enough to do this to try and impress each other, we try and get really thick shades or really, really thin hairlines to the point where most people would look at it and say, I can't read it. So, next slide, please. The thing that's important to know about English round hand, and this is really important to keep in mind, it was a system of handwriting <coughs> that was developed using a feather pen. Okay, no oblique pen holders. Were there metal points back then? Yes, but they were typically hand wrought and handmade. Jalot didn't come along for several, you know, for several hundred, but doing different. And, that, and by the way, it's not pronounced Jalot to my amazement. Bob Herford went over to England to the pen shop, and they were very upset with his pronunciation. It's not Jalot, it's Jillet. I cannot refer to it as Jillet 303. It's Jalot. <laughs> this is Sir William, uh, Sir, Sir John Ayers. And so what's remarkable about this, if you look at the bottom of that picture, I realize it doesn't reproduce real well because this is so difficult to reproduce. That's actually his name, John Ayers. 
the knock that these guys had against them was that some of their work was so obscure people couldn't read it. There was a more common form of the hand, if you ever think about it, I'm gonna show you a sample of Jane Austen's writing. That was round hand with a common form. And as I was in discussion before with, with Brendan Nino, you know, even with the Egyptians, there were hieroglyphics and there was a hieratic hand, which is the, the, the common use. So, next slide, please. But remember, that's a quill pen. There's no oblique pen holder or metal pens here. Here's examples of different types of feather quills. And what a lot of people don't realize is that they used to sell prepared feather quills that could go into a pen holder. I think Bob Herford, my buddy Bob, has a, he was the former uh, editor-in-chief of the Penman's Dental Journal for Iampeth. And those of you who don't know, if anybody doesn't know, Iampeth is the International Association of Master Penmen and Grocers and Teachers of Handwriting. Not all of us who belong to that are master penmen, so it's a, anybody can join it. But that's just basically a feather quill that's been shaped you can put into a little holder. Next slide. So here's Bickham. Everybody, has anybody seen Bickham's Universal Penman? It's a very famous book that's been put out. It's still in print. I think Dover publishes it for like ten dollars. He's got a few different penmen that, that were actually involved with the production of this. But what you're looking at again, form of handwriting. But this is not the actual hand. What this is is an engraved form. And that's something it took a while for me to realize. So, so this is really how they wrote. And I was just in discussion with the head of the museum. I don't know of any existing exemplars of original penmanship pieces by those masters. They may exist, but I tried to find them. I can't. I contacted Brian Walker from England. He has no clue if they exist. I contacted the libraries in England. No, no, they just, I don't think they exist. So, <clears throat> but this is one of Bickham's covers here. You can see an example of a script up there. Why copper plate? Why do people refer to this as copper plate? And it's, there, there are some people whose blood will boil, and my friends in the audience who know this from my aunt, uh, know that it's not copper plate, especially if you're applying it to engrossers or engravers, which I will get into. Next slide, please. This, in order to be printed, had to be engraved by an engraving master onto a plate of copper. Now, we don't know exactly how the name stuck or when it stuck, but the earliest usage I've seen of the name was in the Sir Ambrose Heels book where he uses the term copper plate in addition to round hand. But this is a copper plate, and this is hand engraved. The great thing about copper, and I don't, I've never engraved, but it apparently has a grain that is really conducive to making beautifully smooth curves. And if you make a mistake, you can go back with a burn, burnish over, right, burnish over, correct the mistake. So the question has to be raised, how good were the old English writing masters? We just don't know. But if, our, if the writing masters from the golden age in this country were any indication, I'd say they were pretty good. So we'll, we'll get to more of that later. But this is a copper plate. The, the, the printing method was the intaglio printing method. And so somebody had to engrave it. And if I gave them a sample of my work, and there are times my work wasn't, you know, well, so we care how I say this, it implies that my work was perfect. <laughs> I've never written anything I thought was perfect. I mean that sincerely. You know, I just I was telling somebody before, you know, if I ever got to the point where I thought my work was the match of a past master, I'd stop writing. But for me, it's, it's about the journey of getting there. So if I gave them something and one of my line angles wasn't correct, they could correct it in the engraving. And then Joe Gattolo looks like it's perfection. Uh, next next uh, slide, please. And by the way, something else about this, I do lots of talks in, in my career. So I know better than to put a lot of slides into an hour talk. Typically you want to be at about 35 slides or so. I got close to 60 here. So here's a page from here's a page from Bickham's, uh, Bickham's uh, 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 Universal Penman. The reason why I blew this up is I want to show you in contrast to, well, contrast, in comparison to Jane Austen's own hand. This is English round hand. And I'm going to step away from the mic. There's a few areas I want you to take note of. Notice this lowercase f, the way that it goes behind the f and then comes back out. Notice the e, how it almost looks like a little swiggle there. The d, very characteristic of not only round hand, but also Spencerian will do this as well. E, the d curls, uh, e, d curls back. Notice that characteristic p shape, a vertical line with a v shape coming off of it. And uh, was there anything else on here I wanted to show? Just those things, okay. Next slide, please. Now we take a sample of Jane Austen's writing. All right, and this is, you know, she was writing, this one was probably written sometime around 1800, but notice her E is exactly the same. Not shaded, it's a common form, it's, it's an everyday form. 
Notice her F, go to back. Notice the D's. What I wouldn't give to have an original here. A P the same way. And I, this is where I highlighted it. I highlighted this. Does anybody know what this reads as? M-I-S, it's missed, M-I-S-S. There was a way of writing double S's where the first one looked like an F, but it wasn't an F. The top loop came up and over like an F, and the bottom loop came backwards and out. So it's M-I-S-S. -S. So that's Jane Austen. This is like a form of what would you guys ever would call copper plate, but it's really English round hand. Okay? Next slide. Meanwhile, <laughs> now we were a colony of England. We had many different peoples here, but we were a colony of England. So what was the handwriting in the time in the US? Round hand. Next slide. Anybody know what this is? The top should give it away. <laughs> Who wrote the Declaration of Independence? First penned it. Jefferson. This is one of his, we have this in the, in the Library of Congress. This is one of the original drafts, and I believe the fill-in commentary is, I, I believe it was from uh, Benjamin Franklin but I can't be 100% sure of that, unless somebody in the audience is. Um, but this is what the first declaration looked like for critique. People think, you know, if I say Declaration of Independence to you, an image comes into your mind, which I'll show you. That's not how it was written. And, that's, and it wasn't signed on 1776. So, next slide. The equivalent of a calligrapher, these guys at the time were noted as engrossers and illuminators. But basically engrossers. Timothy Matlack was commissioned, and he wrote this, I think, by about August of 1776. It's sort of like an illuminated piece, but it's, it's, engrosser means to write beautifully. And that's what this is. And if you blow this up, you would see that these are the same patterns that Jane Austen used, with a little bit of shading in it. Does anybody know why it's so hard to read? The paper they wrote it on. That's one reality of it, yes? Yeah, the ink, the iron, the ink. That's another aspect. But let's go to the next slide. This is what you guys know. But this is an engraving. So the question is, who engraved it? A guy named William Sloan in the early 1800s. We all know, come on in, please, don't, don't worry about it. You feel free to walk in. You know, uh, so who, how did he do this? Because this is essentially as identical as they could get it to the original. They believe, this, is, this is hard for me to believe when I first heard about it. They believe he used something called a wedding transfer. They wet the original down, to loosen up the ink, they laid another piece of linen over it, a paper, pressed it, then onto a copper plate, and he engraved it. Mm -hmm. That's why, and this is, this is actually, the other image was actually pretty generous, you could barely read it today. And so, but they used to take that, that one around that Matlack did, they'd nail it to the wall, and if they had, had to move their Congress, they'd nail it to some other wall. And finally somebody said, you know, we've, we've got to do something about this. <laughs> but this is what we, this is what we know, the Declaration of Independence, but it was an engrosser who did that, Matlack. Uh, and Stone is the one who gave us it. There were other versions of this as well, but they were done freehand engraving. They were not exact duplicates. It was Stone's that actually gave them the one that was a duplicate of what Matlack did. All right? And neither one of them represented Jefferson's own handwriting. But in, in, in essence, they were, they were uh, round, round hand. But if you look at the very top of it, at the very top Congress, that's written in more of a stylized Roman hand. Below when you have what appears to be capitals, a very German style influence. So there's many different forms. That's why I would, would point at them when somebody says to me, is this copper plate and grocery script? Sometimes the, the, you know, the lines you can't distinguish completely. Next slide, please. So this is the first point of departure for us. I don't, I had to limit how much I could talk in the time I had. If I had more time, I would put in Jenkins's book. I am, but some of you may or may not know, but I am, but just inquired the Jenkins book from the, I think the copy we, I, I know the copy we have is Jenkins' original copy from the late 1700s. It was the first book of American handwriting that was essentially English round hand. But we have that, and why do we know it? Because it came to us from his family, his descendants, with the provenance to prove it. And there's actually, on the IAMPIT website, you can see, I get chills just talking about it. But the first departure from English round hand for us was Platt Rogers Spencer Sr., as most of you know. Most folks call him Father Spencer. Michael Gasol referred to him as Father Spencer. I think Mark, Mike actually commissioned a beautiful portrait of him. 
Um, and so this is his signature down here, all right? But is that is his real signature or stylized signature from one of his sons? I don't know at this point. There's a reason why I say that. So let's go forward. So if you listen to Mike, Mike's much more eloquent about this than I am. He'll talk about the, you know, the, the oval forms in the ocean and Flat Rogers walking down. But that's all true. As Flat Rogers Spencer said that, I'm just more of a scientist, you know, calibration kind of guy. So um, next slide, please. So this is one of Platt Rogers Spencer's original specimens. This was done with a feather quill pen, not an oblique pen holder. You know, so Charles, with the earliest oblique pen holder, pardon? Earliest oblique pen holder that you know of? The patent was what? Um, Spencerian. Yeah, it was about what, 1850s? 1860, yeah. something like that. Right, and I'll talk about why that's important in a minute. But this was taught, and he preferred to use a feather quill. All right? So if you look at this, now what I'm about to say, please don't take this the wrong way. This is, compared to what I'm about to show you, is a less evolved form of the hand, okay? Flat Rogers developed this. It's sort of like Chuck Berry. You know, God rest his soul, he recently passed away. There are a lot better guitar players than Chuck Berry, but nobody did it first. He did it first. He was there at the beginning. And so Platt Rogers Spencer's students, and especially his children, some specifically some of his children, took this further. And I'll show you what I mean. But this was a form of handwriting with the quill. Next slide. Another point of departure and some key developments occurred at the same period of time. So, so PRS was developing this. For those of you guitar players, don't be poor, Reed Smith and you play Roger Spencer. Sorry. <laughs> um, at the time he was doing this, we all of a sudden had the development of mass produced steel flexible pens. And so, for instance, the eight, the, in eight, we know of a catalog from 1850s that has a Spencerian number one in it, made by the Perry Company. The Jalot 303 was also around there. I have, I have a card, well, I used to have a card of a salesman's car from the late, mid to late 1800s of the Jalot 303, Jilla 303. <laughs> it shows the stages in which it was made. But when these things came out, all right, and these are some about, I, I coined the frame Dream, Dream Points, and I regretted doing that because it drove the prices up. But this is the legendary Jalot Principality. This is a 604 EF. This is my favorite point, the Muscleman Perfection that was made for Gem City Business College. It's essentially the 604 EF. It was made by Jalot for, for uh, D.L. Muscleman School, the Gem City Business College. This is the, the legendary 303. How do you tell a modern one from an old one? Modern ones are bluish black, the old ones are bronze. <clears throat> and there's a difference between vintage and really vintage 303s. The really vintage 303s from the before 1900 were more like the Principality. Then you have a Spencerian number one, much more narrow, it doesn't fit all pen holders, all flanges. And then finally at the end, the clones of the Jalot Principality made by Jalot. And there you have a Zenarian fine writer. When these pens originally sold, we have catalogs that show from the 1910s, 1920s, they were about $1.25 per box of 144 of them gross. <laughs> I was involved in the bidding war a few years back, it was almost $2,000 for a box. It's ridiculous, I wasn't bidding for myself. <laughs> I was bidding for John and Collins, don't tell me I said that. <laughs> but there's a limit to what I think you should pay for these things because they don't last long. I know people have had this pen, no. I'll get into that later. <laughs> <laughs> session. So, so that was another element that allowed Spencer's script to be taken further, all right, more evolved, okay? And I know Mike Sowell probably hate me for saying that, but I just, I'll show you what I mean in a minute. Then we have the entry of the Mobley pen holder. Now, <laughs> this is the pen holder I had some design input into. I only show it because it's the pen holder that I prefer to use, but Disclaimer is I make no profit off any of that. I gave them the, the input free of charge. I don't make any profit of this, this, the stuff I sell. Even my book, if those of you who've downloaded my, my book, I put it out. But not because I'm a great guy. I just see no reason to do it. And I'm in a position where I don't have to do it. But this is an oblique pen holder. For those of you who've never seen it before, it takes the nib and puts it up at an oblique angle. I'll get into more why that's important in a minute. Uh, this is the PIA holder at the time. I was telling Brent and, and, and or Nina, one of them, both of them, when we came out with this, this was 40 bucks, and people were complaining about it. 
Have you guys seen how much pen holders sell for now? You can't even buy them. $200, $300, $400. I have one from Jake Weidman that's, I think, $650. You know? So it's, I mean, it's, it, yeah. <laughs> some, thing, some things you do to help support people. That's why I do it all, to support mentors. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so, this is my favorite pen. This is what I dream about at night. Somebody once asked me. <laughs> somebody asked me at I had a convention years ago, Dr. Joe, why don't you get yourself a nice calligraphy gal and settle down? And so my response was spared a moment, but I really liked the response. So I said, I can never be sure she would be for me on my vintage pen <laughs> And let me say, I had a lot of these. I had, I had six or seven gross boxes of these. Somebody mentioned 357. I was telling Brown, I must have had 1,400 of them because I have an obsessive compulsive type A personality. <laughs> and I also don't have anybody I have to ask if I can spend the money. That's <laughs> the most important thing. But you notice the spread on this? This isn't as sharp as a 303 or, or, or of a principality. However, it's pretty snappy. The quality we look for in ornamental penmanship is not just the ability to spread. It's how fast the, the time snap together. Most people use, not, not nowadays, the the uh, Nico G nib. And look, it, for writing envelopes, you need to have a durable nib. But I could take a Nico G and drive it to a concrete wall so we'll be able to use it. <laughs> and at this point, when I'm writing high grade, when I was writing high grade script, it might only last me a half a page, if that. Yeah. Because the moment my eyes seen the hairline start to deviate from ultra fine, I, tried, I just, I didn't throw it away, I put it into the use box. <laughs> yeah. But when you're writing to impress John DeColibus or Jake Weidman, you know, there's no room for error with that. So, and that sounds ego egotistical to say that. But this muscle imperfection was made for the Gem City Business College, the L Muscleman, and it's essentially a 604EF made by Gelat. Next slide, please. So, why the oblique? And this was an image I actually stole from Michael Soul and modified it for my own use. Uh, I asked Michael first if I could do that. But if you try and write on a slant with a straight pen holder, the right nib time skips across the page. Not dramatic, I'm making it overly dramatic, but you get a ragged inner edge. How many of you guys know Sean Larcher, another guy who passed away from France? He did that to beautiful effect. He loved that, yes. There's nothing wrong with it. And if you were going to do copper plate and straight pen hold, that's gonna to happen to you. It's perfectly fine. The reason why we went with the oblique is the oblique puts the nib in the line of the slant angle, makes your shades much smoother. And it facilitated the development of a more artistic form of Spencerian. Next slide, please. Now, Ty Roger Spencer. I, I don't have better images than this. I, I, I scoured old penmanship journals. But that's actually Platt and his, his sons. Now, what's not represented here is his daughter Sarah, who was also a very good penman. But she always felt that she wasn't given the credit because this is a very, this is a time, patristic time, you know, the, the girls just didn't. <laughs> get the credit, but she actually had a very beautiful hand too. But the one of his sons that really took this far was Lyman P. He was involved in the production of a book that some of you may have heard of called The New Spencerian Compendium. Him and a penman named Flickinger. And that's what most of us look to as the standard. When you talk about round hand, English round hand, you can't codify it into one specific form. There are many different writing masters. You ask me, is there a seminal form for Spencer? And the answer is yes. Platt Roger Spencer originated that hand. So you can point to early form and say, that's what it should look like if you really want to be a purist about it. But it's taken off since then. So Lyman P. And that's, by the way, it's PRS there. Looks a little younger there. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a, 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 an image of, of Lyman P. Spencer's work, OK? And if you look at this letter, and if, I'm going to show you comp compare and contrast with his father's letter. Next slide. This was 1886. Now, I'm not arguing one is prettier, one is better. I'm just talking about the ability to refine these things. Why? Because he was using an oblique pen holder. He was using uh, a flexible steel point that did not, you know, imbibe water and get mushy and have to be recut like a, like a quill did. So if you look, I think every, anybody can see there's a difference here. Again, not better, it's just, it's more refined, all right? Now, even this, 
Is it really handwriting? Next slide, please. Turns out Archibald McGlee's um, um, master engraver were engraving copper plates for that. And so up until the late 1800s, and maybe I'm wrong on when the photolithography came into, into, into existence here, but this is actually one of the, I say actually twice, it's one of the actual plates that McGlee's engraved for that New Spencerian Compendium. These are backwards. I mean, look at the precision of that engraving. Look at the line. It's just amazing. I still have trouble believing that people could do that by hand, even though it's an engraving. And so they would put this into, an, an, I guess, an entaglio press and put ink on it and print these things. But um, and we, th these things are available that people do. You know, uh, uh, some museum has. I don't I forget which one. By the way, we also have the, the copper plate that was used to engrave the Declaration of Independence by Stone. If you look online, it's there. They have it. I don't know if he made many of them, but it's there. So, next slide. Now, we come to another point of departure. This is where we start to tell what people could actually do because, as I said to a few of you, you know, I've seen these such perfect samples that I really would have had a hard time believing were done by a human hand if I didn't see it myself. Next slide. So now we come to the artistic form of Spencerian, what people would call ornamental penmanship or artistic penmanship. Tam would refer to it as artistic penmanship, Luffer on occasion did. And there were a few players in this that were really known to have taken this to a different level. This almost left the realm of handwriting now, and we're in the realm of art, okay? So, two of the biggest players was, were Albert D. Keller, who died extremely young, tuberculosis, and then Louis Monteras, who is considered by many today to be the, the hallmark by which all others are judged. Now, these are difficult to see because, again, you're juxtaposing incredibly fine hairlines with thick shades. It, it becomes difficult to see. For my money, and those of you in the room who have seen this piece before, this is the ultimate for me. What he was able to achieve there is something that I, 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 can, I would love to have seen him write that. But I can tell you, when you track out these things, you have to figure out which direction his pen was moving in. And sometimes the, the shades don't make sense because those of you who do point your pen know you can only make a shade on the downstroke or go back and draw it back in. And so at some of these you trace lines and you find, wait a minute, you couldn't have made this on the upstroke. They must have gone back and added it in. But they practiced these, remember, does anybody remember the Palmer method, the push-pull exercises, the circles? If you practice that enough, eventually your hand is able to do these kinds of movements. So and this, was, this was not executed like this. This was executed like this. No finger movement, wrists locked, all pivot came from the, from the, from the form model on the table. It's called muscular movement. The earliest forms that Platt Roger Spencer was teaching for the large capitals was whole arm movement. And that's where there's no stabilizing muscle on the table. It's arms off the table and you swing it. There are people that are around today that can do it. John DeColibus, I think you've seen him write in person. I've told people it's like a ballet watching him write. But there's few who can really do it well. He's one of them. So, Taylor, Monteraz, Taylor's education back in 1883. Um, also studied with a guy named I.W. Pierce, who will be influential on some of the people I'll show you later. But this is where you get into, this. so, so ask, ask, let me ask you, what is this? Is this Spencerian? Is it copper plate? Is it round? It's not round tan. It's not what we define as copper plate in modern terms. It's a form of Spencerian that's artistic. That's, you know, you can't do this quickly either. I was telling someone that, you know, Del Tisdale, anybody remember Del, Del Tisdale? Del was one of the, probably the few surviving masters that could actually do this by hand. And he, he studied with W.C. Brownfield, who was Madaraz's last student, documented last student. And he, he sat Del down, and Del's like, well, I don't understand. Madaraz is doing this in the cursive freehand style, as you know he wasn't Del. He would do one or two letters, lift his pen up, move the paper, put it back down, write again, two, three more letters, lift the pen up. I was like, no way, there's no connectors. So Brownfield got a magnifying glass from his desk, showed him where the connectors were. He couldn't believe it. So they had different levels of writing. This is not the way Potter often write on everyday script. And sometimes folks confuse that. Next slide, please. So I mentioned the photolithography to you. The Zaner Bloser had literally tons of these plates. 
that were laying in their basement. Mike Sol got his hand on a few of them. He allowed them to take some. He sent one or two to me. And what this represents now is a departure from the intaglio printing to this lithography that represents a photo of the actual writing. Now, it doesn't mean they couldn't correct this. If you look at some of the, the camera-ready work, they have white out and stuff that corrects the, the curve. But you know, this is closer to what the human hand could do. This is the actual plate that print in reverse. And here I reverse the image digitally to show you. And it says the educator for the, for the educated journal that was put out. All right, this is a series of lowercase letters that were put out as well. So, but they had tons of these things. This is a zinc metal plate. I don't know if it was just pure zinc metal. If it was something else, but they would treat this with a, with a weak acid, I think, right, and dissolve all the non-exposed areas. That's how they did this. So it represented the photo of the actual writing. Next uh, slide, please. So. This is something some of you may have seen from my posts online. Uh, I want to just give you this timeline of development. So English round hand up on top that people would sometimes call copper plate in modern times. Form of handwriting done with the feather quill. Okay, narrow cut broad edge. Um, next thing is engrosser script. So why is it engrosser script? Because Timothy Matlack, who did the Declaration of Independence, was known as an engrosser. So the script he used, even though it was round hand, eventually, and this is surmising on my part, I have no documented publications that say this is exactly how it happened. This is what we surmise happened. So it's anecdotal at best. Um, you know, because the engrosser would use this, they called it engrosser script. But it was also used by the engraver. Anybody ever seen old railroad watch? You know, they have the engraving on the mechanism. That was done in the form of round hand. We call it engraver script. Does it matter what you call it? Well, it's not round hand, and it's not, it's round hand in shape, but it's not handwriting. It's engraved forms. And Bill Lilly used to tell me that Luffer told him, Billy is one of my mentors, you know, he told me, he said, Joe, Luffer said this is the equivalent of engraving on paper. If you ever watch my videos, it almost looks that way. You know, you turn the paper, you move things. Then we have Spencerian script by Luffer. And this is also the refined form of it, but a very simplistic approach to it. And now you have the ornamental script. This is by H.P. Berensmeyer, an absolute fabulous penman at, at Gem City Business College um, in Illinois. And his, his script was also very ornate sometimes. They could write simple, basic plain script. And something I'm not going to talk about, but something I spent a lot of time on recently, myself, is simple cursive penmanship, A, a and Palmer penmanship. But before, but uh, concurrent with Palmer, maybe a little after him, was Zayner Bloser as well, um, that came out with the form of this. But it's a simple, unadorned, on non shaded form. Okay. Next slide, please. So in the case of English round hand handwriting, in the case of Spencerian script handwriting, the original form of Spencerian script, what do they have in common? Not the shapes, but they both use the quill pen. Okay. Zanarian College. The reason why I put this here, and there were a few colleges that really were of note, but the one we have the most examples of and most stories from is Zanarian College. Those of you who know who Bill Lilly is, he graduated from this college. It closed, I think, in the 60s. And he continued on as Zayner Bloser. Um, next slide, please. Uh, here's Charles Paxton Zayner on the left and Emma Ward Bloser on the right. Uh, they were two gentlemen who started the college. And I'll, they, uh, Zayner's cousin, Lloyd Kelchner, was also in it with him in the beginning. But for whatever reason, he got out of it pretty quickly. And so he's not really recognized as one of the uh, seminal figures in this. Well, he's a founding figure, but I think Zayner just dragged him into it. They needed money. So uh, but that's a great picture of Zayner. He actually had the whole blackboard writing. Um, next slide, please. This is, this, the building still exists. This is the Sanarian College. This is a few years ago, but it still exists. And that's what the inside classroom looked like. And people went there to study business, you know, bookkeeping, you know, pretty mundane tasks. And I, I like to tell folks, you know, we tend to romanticize this field. Oh, it's, you know, it's so, but Phil, these guys, I've spoken to a few of them. I spoke to Bill Lilly. I spoke to, to, to Steve Zilla before he passed on. I spoke to Chris Castaris. And for them, they were like, what are you talking about? That was my job. You know, it was a, they looked at it very you know, differently than we do now. So, uh, next slide, please. 
So what did the student who went there not, you had summer courses, but if you went there for a course of study, then you were made to produce your own certificate in your own style. And so there were three different grades of seals, and I still, I think I still have one left gold seal, unused gold seal. Uh, I was gonna stab it to my forehead. <laughs> but this is LL Fields. Now Fields can do everything. Fields is an illuminator and everything, but this was his gold seal certificate. I own this up until very recently. And you can see Luffer's fancy signature and ornamental script. Again, not copper plate. Is it, does it fall under Spencerian? Yes, but it's a more artistic form of Spencerian. And then E.W. Blozer is a more like, less stylized uh, version of it. Um, but just, I would, we thought earlier, imagine, imagine having all the work that went into this. And me handing it to you and having you have to do this. And not screw it up. <laughs> I'm serious. I mean, I, I would be really panicked about it. This, they do this once or twice, and they have critiqued on it. But I actually had the critique version, uh, where they were, you know, tell them to straighten things up here and do this. But this is this is a gold seals and area certificate. Next slide. Uh, Willis Baird, one of my heroes in script. This goes to show you they didn't just do script. Baird is a graduate of Narian College of Penmanship. He was also instructed by uh, uh, C.B. Howe, Charlton B. Howe, who I'll be showing you in a moment. And uh, in my opinion, one of the best at this, Chris Castaris, a graduate, worked for him for a short while. He was the, with, with, the De with William Dennis and, and Baird Studios, uh, Dennis and Baird Studios. But he told me, he says, Joe, he was absolutely merciless when he critiqued script. He spared no, he, he wouldn't spare a child if the child was trying to do script. He says, you would not want him looking at your script. <laughs> and so, but that's part of his, that's one of his illuminated pieces there. I mean, his canvas leaves are so real, it feels like you, I've seen the original, you can go in there, pick them out, you know. Next slide. This is Francis B. Courtney. He was known as the Pen Wizard. This also was an original piece I had on my wall. And uh, I think it was done in the 30s. Can't really make it out there. But this piece up here, the bird, if you can tell it's a bird, this was offhand flourish. This was probably done in less than five minutes. This was something itinerant and penman would do to attract students. They would travel from school to town to town in the early 1800s, mid 1800s, set up and you know, do their wares on the street, try and attract people, get them to bring their students to them, and the children to them. This is Francis Courtney's uh, stylized signature. This is something that Michael Saul called at coined the term needle stitch script. It wasn't referred to that at the time, but there's an interrupt at the midway of the X height of these minuscules. Uh, and it gives you a, almost a stitched appearance. Now, those are done in sort of a engrosser script slash round hand style, but they're stylized. And what's he combined them with? Ornamental caps. So that's why it's sometimes difficult to just put a finger on this and say, it's this. It's like the musicians who complain, they want, they want to call me country, but I'm not really country. Same type of thing. But this is, this is an amazing piece to me. We have lots of specimens like this. The Iapeth archives are replete with these types of things. Uh, next, next, specimen, uh, next slide. This is also some of Courtney's work. He had this freakish ability with the pen to see things and do things. Like some people, he was able to write in two different directions at the same time at once, but do it precisely. These are some type of backwards letters. This is some, I, I can't even read this stuff, but I'm told it does read that way. He was known for these kinds of little playful things. And these are letterheads. But heads composed of individual letters. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, he, uh, <clears throat> he was fabulous. And there was a Mata Roswell I'll be showing you. There's a famous story, and I don't know how true the story is, but this is what's been told. You know, they, they had a friendly competition. And Courtney was known as one of the best, but Mata Roswell really looked at it as like the man. And so they were, at, they were supposed to be at a, a, a meeting. Courtney penned some, some sentences, shoved the paper over to Monteros and said, match that in a day. Monteros penned a single letter, told him, match it in a lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> it's supposed to be a true story. <laughs> Next slide. So there were women involved with this too. Now sometimes I get, I get comments like, what do you mean pen men? But the reality was that the women considered themselves penmen who did this. And this is showing you Mary Champion, and it says, Penman, plural, of the Capital City Commercial College, Des Moines, Iowa. And there's Mary Champion, that's a portrait of her. 
and uh, she had her own handwriting book out that was very similar to Palmer. We also have an image, a very poor image, which I had and then took it out of her Zanarian certificate in handwriting, gold seal. But we're, we don't know it's gold, we're assuming it is because she was so good. It's just a black and white picture. Mary Champion, next slide. This shows that she can do more than just simple script. Right? And these are ornamental capitals. They vary sometimes in their, notice here how there's very little shading here, so delicate. What I like to tell folks is strip all of the spaghetti away. What you have left is the essence of your script. You know, if you, we live and die by lowercase letters when we write. If your lowercase letters aren't good, it doesn't matter how much spaghetti you put on the envelope <laughs> or on the letter. So, next slide, please. Canon, we've I talked to a few people with this. This, this, I get a phone call out of the blue, and uh, because of my Zanarian.com website, she says, are you Belgio Vitolo Zanarian? I said, yes. She says, I have this, this, this picture. I don't know, what, what, what is it? And she says, well, the name on it says T.T. Tanan, and right away my ears perked up. So I, I forget what the town was, and I says, is this town in Norristown, Pennsylvania? And she got spooked, she said, what do you mean? How'd you know that? I said, I think what you're asking me about is C.C. Canon. Maybe it's possible, I says, it's a Zanarian Art College, because before the college became the Zanarian College of Pemmich, it was a Zanarian Art College. Mm -hmm. This is one of the most important figures in the historical ornamental penmanship, because like Taylor and Monteras, his script was elevated to that point where it was so far above most other people's. But notice the dates on his life? Wow. Appendicitis took him out. Wow. <laughs> so this was his Zanarian certificate. So I, and I was trying to be honest with him. I didn't want to take this one for us. listen. Take it to an auction house, you post it on eBay. I don't want to do that, but I don't know what this, you know, what this would bring. She says, I want you to have it because of the website. So I don't want to say what well, I paid for it, but it wasn't nearly what it's worth. But I told her what it should be. She goes, she didn't want it, she didn't want to go that road. So this to me, in my opinion, was a little good coming back to me for all I did for penmanship. So I no longer have this piece, but if you if you look at this piece, and I'll show you a closer, because I realize you can't see much here, but this is unusual in that we have both E.W. Blozer and C.P. Zanger's signature on here. You can't really see it too well, but this is a crazy signature. Well, again, think about the work it took to go into here. And I wondered, did they sign these first and then have them do it? <laughs> How many of us in this room have tried to move a pointed pen and have it stick and snap? I've got many points that did that. I would be panicked if I had to do this. So, to make a long story short, this represents a real historical, another one of those pivotal moments in where we had somebody who came along and was just head and heels above the rest. Next slide, please. I'll show you a close-up of the work. Now, he was a relatively young man when he did this. And he wasn't using springy paper. This was heavy cardstock. The problem is, back then, a lot of paper, most of the paper was acid-containing wood pulp. You combine that with iron gold based inks where you have you know, ferrous sulfate included with tannic acid in an aqueous solution that then precipitates out. It's like a chemist, don't I? Uh, it's not like I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you say it with authority, people will believe you. But <laughs> these things, in the presence of moisture in the air, because ions are reducing metal, can actually take the moisture and produce free radicals, which will actually cleave the paper. We have specimens in the iampeth archives where the shades on the paper are missing. You can see right through the paper. Hydroxyl radical cleaving these things, and, 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 and free, uh, different free radicals are cleaving them. So, but this is a close-up of that of that certificate, one of those beautiful beads you'll ever see. And up here, notice this is a this is still sort of a Spencerian style. It's more shaded. So, is it Spencerian? Is it is it copper plate? My, my, who cares? <laughs> it's beautiful. You know, I mean, that's my way of looking. I mean, I mean it partially. To see she sleep. It's really, it's really the truth. I mean, it's just people look at it. You want to emulate it? Great. Next slide, please. <coughs> now we have somebody who's called the Dean of Engrossers, William E. Dennis. This is the piece in the possession of Neil McCaffrey. Anybody here with McCaffrey's inks? Yeah. Yeah. inks. Well, Neil's the one who makes them, as well as the little stainless steel ink wells. And there are some modern calligraphers that don't, don't like this. I've had this comment passed to me because it seems too dated style, too many styles at once, but 
This type of piece was pr produced to show people what they could do. So you had incredible, you know, this is retouched broad pen lettering. You had these incredible, these are swans down. He was Peter actually called Dennis Swans. Um, all these birds around the top. A very stylized piece of pseudo ornamental, pseudo round hand. And Dennis, while well, he used a, a pointed pen likely for this, he loved quills. And one of the things that folks don't realize is that a very important figure, as you guys probably know out of England, is Edward Johnston. You know, but Johnston is credited for not you know, the one who reinvented writing with the quill. These guys were doing it before his publications. Just because there wasn't instant keen, it doesn't take away from what Johnston did. It was those were important publications. But we didn't have instantaneous communication now. These guys were just doing that because they were taught it from their people before them. And so we actually have some of his remaining quill. I mean, I'll go through these things quite. But what he would do is take a goose quill, a really big white feather, <clears throat> soak it in water, stick an ice cream cone stick into it. So it deformed it and flattened it. They cured it in sand, then cut it, and you have these really wide edges. So, and I've done it, I've, I've actually written on, on cask and vellum with, with, with quills, it's, it's unbelievable. I wouldn't do my script on that, but there's an unbelievable sensation. So William E. Dennis, notice down here I got two important names which are, are beyond the scope of this discussion. And that's George Gaskell and A.N. Palmer. Palmer I mentioned before because he might not have been the most a refined of penmen, but he's the one who put out the A. and Palmer, the Palmer method that so many people were taught in, in public schools, and even, I guess, in, in, in non-public schools. Uh, and then there's George Gaskell, who played a key role in the development of many of these individuals, including him. Gaskell had a school, he also had Gaskell's Compendium. And uh, Dennis went there, as did A. and Palmer. And they studied, with, they, they studied with Gaskell. Although Dennis complained that Gaskell was hard to find. Don't know what that meant, but historically, it's what he said. Next slide, please. C.V. Howe is another one of my heroes in script. This is actually a very small specimen. It's about yay big. And they were able to write incredibly tiny. This, this is what he refers to as engraver's script capitals. Could you have referred to as engrosser script? Yes. Could you refer to it as round hand? There are some who would argue no. It's in the round hand style. But the purists would say round hand is written with a feather quill. Whatever. I mean, I would have no trouble calling it round hand. There's an area manual that calls it round hand. I'd have no trouble calling it round hand. I think I sent that one to, anybody know Dr. Gale from Instagram? I think I sent that to her. I can't remember. Anyway, next slide. This shows you how small they could write. These lowercase letters are precise. They're about a little bit bigger than the thickness of a penny. You could put a gun to my head and keep me in a room all day, and I couldn't do that. <laughs> so I asked Steve Ziller about this. Everybody heard of Ziller of KC, you know, the, the, the company? Steve was a Zenarian graduate, worked with FW Tamlin for a while. He told me, he says, Joe, they used to use mapping points, very fine mapping points, with magnifying glasses. And he said, when we were trying to write our best work for each other, we might only write a word or two and then get up and leave it. Because the moment you lose focus is the moment you lose the piece. And uh, this would give me a headache. I just, uh, it's, it's, my, anyway. Yeah. Chris Kastaris, an Aaron graduate, when he was talking to John Nicolabus about, I remember I mentioned Baird, how brutally Baird was about his assessments. He saw both my work in John's work, and he says, to, he says to John, John, you guys write big. <laughs> he followed up with, amateurs write big. <laughs> he said, experts write small, or were small in those days. And so John and I were going to have t-shirts that said amateurs and script. <laughs> <laughs> Next slide. This is Luff, one of my favorite pieces from, from Luff, where I think Gail Madelak had, no, no. Chin Long has this piece, I think. Um, there's a combination of two different styles on here. We have the Spencerian slash ornamental style, and we also have the grocery script, engraver script, or round here, if you want to call it that. <clears throat> and so, this is a beautiful piece by Love. Do you notice those shadows here? Here, here. You know what they are? This laying against another iron balling specimen in an album. Remember, the pigment is iron. Iron oxidizes, which means it rusts in the right conditions. It can still remain black for years, 
but under the right conditions, it will rust, it will oxidize. So, next slide, you can do a close up of this. There you can see, that's one of the most beautiful D's I've ever seen. I, I, D is my nemesis in script. <laughs> People have heard me joke about this a lot, but it's the truth. I, I tried to pen a letter to Bill Lilly, and I think I destroyed 40 sheets because I couldn't get past the Dear Bill part. <laughs> <laughs> and so finally I had to take a pencil out, pencil the D, and then trace over it. It's just, it's just and yet in, 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 in regular cursive penmanship, I love it. But if you notice certain things here, notice the ending T here. Beautiful T. I think you still recognize it as a T. Uh, how delicate and shaded this is. It's not the predominant form. Now, I prefer the heavily shaded stuff because that's what I was doing. But this is so delicate and it's very precise. Um, next slide. Madaraz, who is sometimes referred to him as Madaraz the Great. Uh, he died of diabetes complications. and. Uh, uh, this is just an example of the kind of letter he would produce. And they would say, and Brownfield said he wouldn't even warm up. He could do this pretty much off the, you know, off the cuff if he wanted to. Next slide, please. I'll show you a close-up of it. He also has a form, some of you may have seen it, where he likes little sword swashes, where these things come really thick and back in. But when I was first doing this, I didn't know you had to do it and build it up. So I'm snapping pen points trying to get it thick. <laughs> <coughs> That was penned in 1909, a year before he passed away. But absolutely gorgeous. And again, one of the people who we believe is responsible for elevating the hand to a more artistic, well, to an artistic form, not more artistic, artistic form. Uh, but even the, the placement of these shades, each other. I don't know if he planned it that way or his eye was just that good. Some people have a real natural eye for this stuff. <clears throat> that wouldn't have worked for me. It would have been off. And I mean that seriously. Uh, if you look at the way he started this thing, well, you have to say it only works on downstrokes, right? And so if it's only on downstrokes, he couldn't have started from up there and pushed, right? Chances are he started from here. Came up around, slash. Down around, slash. And he probably didn't do it well, that's why he's got the dot there. But these guys are capable of laying the point down the same line. Unless you had a magnifying glass. Even then, it was hard to tell. Next slide. This is his engrosser script, or engraver script, or whatever you want to call it. But with what kind of caps? Ornamental caps, Spencerian style ornamental caps. Very dramatic. Now here's a big difference. Some people mistakenly think that engrosser script, especially Zanarian engrosser script, has to be done with lifting the pen at the baseline when you do lowercase letters. And that is true when you do Luck variants of the Zanarian script. But Luckford wasn't the first author of the Zanarian manual, C.P. Zayner was. So you look at the 1901 edition, it's different. Madaraz is vehemently opposed, and he, he wrote about it, to, to lifting the pen at the baseline here. He called it stunted script, which interf interfered with the flow of the script. So Madaraz does not, does not do that. He doesn't lift his pen up. I teach a Lovefarian style of engrosser script, but unlike Lovefer, I don't lift my pen at the baseline. I write it more like Madaraz does. John DeColibus' script looks more like that, but he lifts at the baseline. Does it matter? No. <laughs> People talk, I, I ask, why do you lift your pen up? Because you can bring fibers up with the paper, you don't want to drag them across, right? It sounds reasonable. However, what about when you're doing this? Where are the fibers? <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. Love for wrote an article, and for the life of me, I cannot find the article reference in one of the early business educators. Somebody asked the question, why do you have students lift the pen at the baseline? His response was to give the novice a chance to think of where they're going. <laughs> now, I don't know if that's the real reason for it or not, but that's what he said. Next slide. I, I blow this great, the top one up again. So you can see the line quality. It's just fabulous. How do you know these guys were moving at speed? And I don't mean ridiculous speed, but it was a control speed when they were doing these kinds of letters, the big, the big letters. You see no squiggles. There's no hesitation. Anybody ever read the book, uh, the, the Zen in the Art of Archery? There's this part in there where they're describing a writing master with a brush. And the comment is that the letter is formed at the moment the mind's eye conceives it, no hesitation. And that's what these guys know the form so well, they had such skill, there was no hesitation. When they, when they, even myself, I'll hesitate. Once I do that, I'm doomed. But I don't do this kind of work. If you watch me in my videos, 
I'm like this with my fingers. So, but that's about as good. And he had a trick with the lowercase s. Occasionally he would not connect this part and put a drop there so it gave the impression of an incredibly fine hair like you couldn't see. <laughs> <coughs> and he was able to do this. I don't have a sample of it here, but he would weight this down in different ways. It looked like a raindrop on a very thin vine, about ready to fall. That's the kind of stuff that us lettering freaks can talk about in the Hampton Convention for an hour. <laughs> uh, next, next, next slide, please. So, Anna Studd Giddens, another very important figure. She is somebody who was considered to be the female equivalent of Madaras. And, uh, but she became quite ill and sort of fell out you know, her period of time was the late 1800s, very early 1900s. So here you can see her beautiful ornamental script. Uh, next sl next uh, slide, please. She was also an engrosser. She made this cover for a 1998 edition of the Western Penman. <coughs> Just beautiful work. Next slide. Charles Norder, one of, another one of my heroes. Uh, Norder was notorious for retouching things in the ticket. He retouched it until it was the way he wanted it. He had no ego problem with, what do you mean you're retouching? Most people think this has to be done perfect or it's, can't, no. His final objective was the, was, was the gold. You know, and so he'd retouch continually. But this is remarkable, I mean, remarkable script. And it's got such, I mean, look at the symmetry of curves. Anyone who's ever seen my articles or my, 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 my forms know I talk about how the base of this E and this T and this I and this portion of the N and that portion of the G are all identical. It creates a symmetry in the eye that you can't really put your fingers on. When I discovered that, it changed my script completely. Because all of a sudden, an A shouldn't look very different than a C. It shouldn't look very different than an E. Um, and even if you look at the base curvature of this M, very similar. Just wonderful. I picked up this A off him. See the curly Q at the top there? That's where I stole that from. <laughs> <coughs> but Nord was a fabulous. Go to the next slide, please. This very famous thing, I own the original of this at one time, um, but it's probably the most famous numbers in, in our world of doing this is from the Zenarian Manual. It's like page, I forget what page it's from, but you know, so when I got this, I couldn't wait to really scrutinize it. And so I still love making a four very similar. I love this four, I just love it. Um, but the eight gets a lot of people because the slant angle, which is this, is down the center of the eight. And so your reverse compound curve has to, has to cut that, has to bisect the angle. Very difficult to do. How did Norder do it? Next slide. Didn't realize until I turned it over. These are not pen, they were drawn. The reverse of this is showing him in pencil drawing out the letters. Now what should impress you about this, even though he drew them, is they're pretty much identical to what they did on the opposite side. This is not thin paper. This is thick cardstock. There's no way you could have seen it. And plus, it wasn't done in reverse. That's why going to Iampeth and studying these things is so important because you don't realize um, you don't realize what how some of these things were done. Like I, said, I had to see some of this stuff, my, stuff with my own eyes to be able to believe it. Next slide. This is the man himself, C.P. Zayner. Um, this is a piece he did, a cut for reproduction. If you look at this piece really carefully, you will see pen pencil lines like here. You see that? You make it out. He traced out the track that he wanted to go in pencil. He didn't trace over it. He executed this freehand, but using those lines as a guide to where he was going. That's why they're not exact. He had that kind of skill with the pen. And so what is this? Is this in Syrian? Is this copper plate round hand. Again, my response is who cares, but you know, the reality is is that this is a form, the lowercase letters are forms of engrosser script, engraver script. What the Zenarian manual would call round hand, again, some people would say it's incorrect. Uh, and then you see down here, Spencerian, some ornamental caps, ornamental caps used up here. This is not a standard cap from round hand. Ornamental. The combinations of these things. They didn't worry that much about it. 
We were going after an effect, a final effect. Penned in 1904. Next slide. So this, is a, this, this was an image that I had on my Zenaria.com website. Uh, it wasn't that big, but this is something that was it, it probably, the lines themselves were, were executed rather quickly by him, but not the shades. He probably went back and put the shades on there. The reason why I say that, if you look at the directionality of the shading, if you had a downstroke here, you can't come upstroke for that shade, you understand? The same thing here. If you had a downstroke here, come around, you can make that. I've seen John do that before. But you have to trace the shades out. In the end, how he made it, there are people today, there's a gal on, I keep forgetting her name, Connie? Connie, Connie apparently practices hours a day, and she's got some pretty incredible movement. Uh, whether or not she could execute this to this level of precision, did he use protractors to do this, no one will ever know. My dream is that one day they'll, they'll realize that there was a, 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 some type of film that was done early on of him writing, and we could see what, what they really wrote like. <coughs> Next slide, please. This was his, he considered this his masterpiece of, I didn't touch much on offhand flourishing. This is not an offhand piece. This is a very carefully planned piece. Okay, it probably took him a while to do this, especially the, the definition of the head. But you can bet your life any of these strokes were done offhand. But the actual overall piece was planned out. That was his ego, and there's still advertisements. I forget what they were selling that for, but Iampeth has a really good reproduction of it. They thought it was original. And until we closely examined it one year, it turned out it was a print. So, next slide. And here's Zayner pictured in the car literally a few weeks before he was killed in the bad train. So that's him. His wife is next to him. It tells you who was in the car with him, but that was taken shortly before he died. Tragic loss. Next slide. So before we go to the following slide, I want you to, I, I love showing this image because I've, I'm constantly challenged by people who think they can't do it, they can't get any better, they just, there's just no way it's going to happen for me. I, I try and I just can't improve. Okay, next slide. I'll let this one sink in. So this guy has, I don't know if he's got vestigial parts below the elbow, but he's basically holding this pen with his elbow. And he's producing that. All right? So you can sit there and say to yourself, this is an extreme case of talent or an extreme case of will to do it. Next slide. Many of you have seen this image of mine. But where I basically spend most of my time today is in monoline penmanship. And I do this to try and help folks like myself promote penmanship, but I don't consider myself I mean it sincerely, an expert in cursive penmanship. What you see on the right hand side is more calligraphy to me than just penmanship. It's slowly drawn, it's very carefully drawn. My regular handwriting is pretty sloppy, but I do this so people can see it, maybe get interested in the Palmer method or Mike Soul's American cursive penmanship. That's why I do that. So, you know, I'm not trying to pass it off or pass myself off as an expert. <coughs> I'm an expert in grocery script, but not in hand, cursive handwriting. Um, but it has inspired some people to pick up their fountain. I, we do this mainly on the Fountain Pen Network on Facebook, and for people to pick up their fountain pens and try and do this, because you don't have to have a dip well. You don't have to do any of that. There are some flexible fountain pens, which scares the heck out of me, but I just, I don't flex my fountain pens. And uh, there was a gentleman who was supposed to be coming down here to say hello to me. His name is Tim Cullen. Uh, he makes custom-made fountain pens, and he was kind enough to, to put my, my, my own fountain pen out called a Model V. Now there's only, it's limited, limited to 20 of them. I'm not saying this to promote it. I make no money from the sale of that pen. I permitted Tim, Tim to use my name just to help him out and also to promote this as well. So um, um, but I was incredibly flattered by the offer to do that. And what I got out of that deal was one of the, pro the prototype. So I have the prototype in my possession. And it's not a cheap pen, it sells for about 650, uh, eight and caracal point. It's not meant for flex. I guess you can get a flex variant of it if you want, but um, <clears throat> Mike Masayama is a nib master out of California, Mike lives in, and um, he will custom grind the points for us. I like very fine, what I've got in my pocket is a Sailor Pro Gear. This has a Japanese extra fine nib on it. 
Japanese extra fines are probably equivalent to a European XX fine. Their mediums are more like a fine nib. So they run very, and the reason why I do it is so I can get finer lines like that. But that's, you know, people assume that's my handwriting. It's like, no, that's not my handwriting. <laughs> Nor is this my handwriting. This was penned by me, I think, back in 2002 or 2003. And hopefully, I don't have a picture of it here, but hopefully some of you know about my my book, my iBook. If you have a if you have a iPad or a Mac computer, and if you don't, I have a PDF version of it out, all free download, including the guidelines that I use. Uh, my YouTube channel is still up with all my videos. Um, and at this point, I think I'm done. I threw a lot of slides. <laughs> have any questions about this stuff or tools or techniques or inks or things like that. I don't have to claim to have all the answers, but uh, I'm more than happy to give you my input if I can. <laughs>